Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. You guys know how passionate I am about mental health. And I've had my own journey, as you know, through my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, Take Action Over Anxiety to Enjoy Being You. And those of you who have read it know my story. And it's something that when you've gone through a journey like that, it's something you hold on to. It really forms you. It it creates this foundation of who you are in a unique way. And you look at life in a new perspective when you have come out on the other side of a journey with, related to mental health challenges. And so today we're going to talk about mental health, but we're going to talk about mental health and navigating it through the lens of holistic measures, meaning food, meaning the things that God has naturally provided for us that oftentimes we forget exist or we don't put emphasis on them and therefore our bodies might be lacking. And if our bodies are lacking, our brains are lacking and therefore anxiety, depression, addiction, all of those things can manifest in a bigger, bolder way. And we can go down a path that is unhealthy and it's harder to get back on track and healthy again. But before we dive into the conversation with Tracy Fiaggia, I want to emphasize a couple of statistics and why this is so important. 40% of adults have some sort of mental health challenge, especially related to anxiety, and 32% of adolescents have anxiety-related disorders. These numbers actually elevated by 25% just in the year of 2020 into 2021. As you know, we experienced COVID, kids were learning online, they were on their devices more, so were adults. So especially for women and children, that prevalence increased by 25%. That is why this is so incredibly important because if we don't have positive minds, we're not gonna have a positive country, we're not gonna have a positive world. So we need to be able to step into some ownership and start using these holistic measures that God has given us to navigate our total body health, mind, body, and spirit. So without further ado, Tracy Spiaggia, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you, Robin. I'm so delighted to be here. That was a beautiful introduction. I mean, every single word, I'm nodding my head. And it, it's always just so affirming every time you you grow your tribe by one of people who see life the same way that you do. Um, if, would you would you be okay if before we start, I just just uh, share a quick prayer? Just would yes, like to Tracy. open up. Absolutely, you go right ahead. Dear Lord, um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity for this professional relationship that is um, taking on even the aspect of friendship. I thank you for community. And I thank you, uh, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made, making us all holy and righteous, that we can stand before the throne of God with confidence. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be sanctified into the likeness of Jesus every single day. Just so grateful for um, the sacrifice, Jesus, you made. And I pray that your words fill my mouth today and they land in just the right way on just the right people that you would have it. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here and be um, able to share about a topic that um, without some time constraints, I feel like I could talk for days, days and weeks <laughs> and months. So uh, incredibly um, passionate about um, the area of mental health. I think, I think for me, the tragedy of it, and there's tragedy in all disease, but the tragedy that's unique, in my opinion, to mental health is we forget that the brain is an organ, just like every other organ in the body. And the brain <clears throat> has, has needs, just like every other organ in the body has needs. And when it doesn't uh, get those needs met, the symptoms um, are, are our behaviors. And so when our behaviors are less than desirable or problematic in one way or another, uh, people tend to back away and um, they, they start throwing up boundaries because it's, uh, it's frightening, it's unknown, it's a little bit mysterious. And um, that to me is like when people need people the most is when, when they're, they're struggling with mental health challenges is when people tend to back away. 
So, um, you know, just really loving the chosen. And um, I was watching recently the episode with the leper that happened upon Jesus and the disciples, and they all just kind of rage. And I know leprosy is a, is a physical disease, but as they all retreated from him, watching Jesus move towards him, and even all of the disciples are shouting at him, knowing at this point that he is indeed God. They're still sh as if he is an omniscient and omnipotent. Um, they're shouting at him not to move closer to the leper. And yet he does. And you just see him embrace the leper and the, and the leper not only be physically healed, but emotionally healed because Jesus moved closer to the person that all of society and all of culture moved away from. And for me, like that really embodied what it looks like to have mental illness and how much more tragic if you are a child who's struggling. And um, yeah, so, the, you know, for me, mental health is something that happens. Um, mental health happens within the context of a healthy family unit. And mental illness is not something that's experienced in a silo. So if you have a family member or if you yourself are struggling, it's not like you're the problem every you know like drop the problem person off at the expert's office i'll see you in an hour fix this person it's not the way that mental illness mental health should be looked at or addressed or approached it's a family dynamic and when if the rest of the world is going to kind of create their boundaries and move away because the symptoms of the inflamed brain are disordered behaviors that's when family should be moving in tight and moving in close and coming around the person who means the most to them to say, while others are fleeing the other direction, we're going to press in tight and we're going to, we're going to um, be part of how you heal. And that's really why I wake up every day is to encourage families to be part of the healing story. Mm, so I love that so much. And it's, it's interesting, Tracy, that you have the same perspective I have because we're very similar and, you know, listeners, I didn't mention this, but Tracy happens to be one of my coaching clients and she's right. Like our, we have so many similarities and this, ha this happens with every single one of my clients, but I, I love them and I bring them in and I get to cheerlead them and for them and, you know, walk side by side, hand in hand as business transforms, but as business transform, life transforms. And Tracy and I have discovered through our time working together that we have a lot of similarities in our personalities and our past. And of course, our passion for life and for Christ and for everything that we do when it comes to serving other people. And the one thing that when I was writing my book, Tracy, is that I wrote the teen book, but I thought I can't just stop there because this isn't just about the teen. And a parent can't just say, get over it and expect their teen to, to be, but it folds into depression, bipolar disorder, any other disorder that our brains are going through. And that's why I created the parent book because parents are part of the team. Kids need a team. And it brings me to, it makes me think too of, you know, there's, People say, oh, the nuclear family isn't important, but there's nothing more important than a family unit, the way God created a family unit to be. And I just think that we need to grasp onto that. And no matter if you live in the same home or you don't live in the same home, but both parents need to love and nurture and care for their children and be aware of signs, symptoms, triggers, those things that are happening that their kid can't navigate by themselves. So I love that you emphasize that. Now, Tracy, I would love for you to talk because you work especially with moms and either their mental health journey or moms who have children with a mental health journey that they need help navigating or help help helping their child. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you got to this point in your journey, because I think your story is something a lot of people could relate to, but, and then we can talk about how integral, integral the, the mom's role is in helping their child navigate mental health. Oh my goodness. Yes. It's the, it, to me, it's, it is the non-negotiable component, the, the non-negotiable powerful piece to, um, not only the individual healing, but the family healing. And that's why healing mom and her family is the tagline of my business. So 
Um, I really do believe that moms are the cornerstone of every single home. And I also believe, and I've never heard this preached anywhere. I've never heard this anywhere. I just feel like it's something that God gave me and maybe it's out there. I don't think he ever inspires just one person with a nugget of his truth. It's just something I've come to really embody and embrace is that I feel like moms are the Holy Spirit representative of the Trinity inside the home. You know, I feel like God's always God. Uh, Jesus is represented by the husband who's the head of the home. And then mom is the Holy Spirit who hovers over the family and makes order out of chaos. And, um, you know, if we really can wrap our hearts and heads around that dynamic, we can all get in our proper roles as as God calls us to, and we can we can move mountains. We really can. Um, you know, you think about when a husband and wife are raising their family, the micromanagement of mom. She she like becomes this Medusa of sorts with like five hundred arms and you know attention span that can be splintered a thousand directions. I mean, it's no wonder all of us you know with families have some level of attention deficit. It's like we've trained and conditioned her brain to splinter and constantly be on the lookout for need, 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 need. Um, so, you know, if mom is representing, you know, the is embodying the Holy Spirit and making order out of chaos, she is the one I believe ordained by God to have an intuition inside of her unique to her husband, where she can sense far earlier and with much more accuracy and detail, the goings on inside each of her children and frankly, even inside of her husband. And so if we could really embrace that instead of trying to conform to culture's expectations that, you know, both parents rush outside the home and we go and make a name for ourselves outside the home and we have all of this professional success, which I'm not saying that they are mutually exclusive, but I'm saying if we can, we can have, we can do something more concurrent. If we prioritize that role of being that Holy Spirit representative of of being kind of the one who's got her finger on the pulse of all things running in the home um i i think that we can anticipate and get in front of an illness long before it becomes that so if we see sleep patterns begin to disrupt or we see appetite starting to shift or friendships that had been enjoyed for a long time all of a sudden dissolving if we see things that used to interest them no longer do if they're apathetic if they're disengaged we can't always chalk that up to its typical tween or teen behavior, they'll be okay. If mom can really have her finger on the pulse of the family and be empowered and equipped with all of this information as far as early warning signs and how to powerfully intervene, I really do feel like moms alone can impact these climbing numbers of mental illness. I really do believe that. I really do believe that she has inside of her a power that is unique to the mother. And, and that should be, that should be thrilling news, nothing that should overwhelm or um, cause us to kind of run in the other direction. We're called to this and, um, and God will give us everything we need to show up strong for it. But how I got here is, I feel like most people who are really passionate and they're in, in some capacity in the helping field, um, they usually have a personal story that brought them there. And I'm no different growing up, I grew up in a kind of a typical, I was born to, in 1971. So like through the seventies and eighties at a pretty typical household with a police officer for dad, a stay at home mom, really, really, really tiny house for kids, very little money. Um, lots of stress for my parents that I can appreciate now as a full grown adult, that is hard to appreciate when you're just a kid. The expectation in my body is for safety and provision. The provision was somewhat there, but the safety wasn't always there in, in, in always, I'm not just talking physical safety, but emotional and relational and spiritual safety. There's forms of safety inside the home that what that we're missing. So um, I definitely had my own um, personal struggles with depressive episodes that would really come and go. And when they would come, they, they really had the power to bring me pretty low. Um, I found fitness and um, I've been um, an enthusiastic uh, distance runner and weight trainer since about age 13. And um, I know God gave that to me. It, you know, when I train, uh, my whole biochemistry has changed. My whole outlook has changed. 
Um, it, you know, it's, it's, I've been with my husband for 31 years now and, um, he'll say to me sometimes like, could you go for a run today? Like, I think you could, you, you, I think you should squeeze in a workout. Like that's always been, um, and there's some really interesting factoids about why that is. It's very, very interesting the way God designed the body. He's, he's just, he's just the master, but, um, but I did deal with my own and then, um, came into a couple health crises, not only physical, but also mental with my own child. And, um, I mean, all three of my kids, had a season where they needed extra support and love and direction. There's no question. I don't think you get through the tween teen years without significant struggle. It's like the caterpillar wriggling out of that chrysalis. Like if you cut that chrysalis open and you deny the caterpillar the opportunity to wriggle out, it actually will die. The struggle is imperative. It's a non-negotiable to that caterpillar being able to become the butterfly that God you know, designed it to be. So they all struggle, but one of my children in particular, she had a really rough time and um, it was preceded when she was very young, two, three years old with some physical health challenges that I had to go back to school to figure out mainstream conventional medicine kind of was putting her in boxes that didn't make sense to me. Asthma, um, possibly cystic fibrosis, severe food allergy, you know, they just weren't making sense they really weren't making sense. So I, I went back to school and got um, some significant functional nutrition training and, and figured out for myself, she was having a severe reaction to Danimal's yogurt drinks, whether it was the conventionally raised, um, you know, cow's milk, whether it was the red and blue dyes, whether it was preservatives, whatever the concoction in that bottle um, was really doing a, a number on my daughter's health. So um, I think the ramifications of that are still playing themselves out and she's almost 18 years old, but she had that health crisis, which brought me back into that, into school for functional nutrition lifestyle. But then I started specializing in mental health when um, first, when one of my very dear friends that I had been in a friendship with since kindergarten um, suddenly took her life um, in July of 2007, um, out of nowhere, it seemed. And um, I literally was talking with the husband before we jumped on our call today. So part of what made me like a little bit late for us today is he still reaches out. He's still untangling. He's still profoundly grieving. Um, so that was cataclysmic for me to lose a friend um, in such a gruesome way. Um, so that started me on my journey of understanding mental health on a, on a more clinical level, on a more functional level. And then of course, when my own daughter um, had her own struggles beginning at age 11, I had to roll the sleeves up and I had to really just get as much training and equipping as possible because it was going to be me that made order out of the chaos. And I'm not suggesting that's because I'm, you know, this, this extraordinary person, I'm just a regular person, but God lives in me. So I can do extraordinary things by his power and by his instruction and by his prompting. What I was able to do for my daughter, there's no way that any um, doctor out there was going to be invested in her outcome the way I was. So certainly I had, you know, like people that I would bring in here and there, because of course you need a team, but I was the CEO of that experience. And I really do believe it's by the mercy and grace of God that I had the resources, not just the financial resources, but the mental bandwidth to keep learning and exploring and digging in. And I have a pretty tenacious personality. I really do believe that that is what uh, facilitated a, this beautiful outcome for her. Not suggesting that she doesn't wake up with some bad days because she does, and today was one of them. But she was spared the um, the gauntlet of experimental medications and you know maybe inpatient experiences that are horrifying and even life defining. She was spared all that. I was able to just bring her home, slow down her life tremendously, insulate her calm her nervous system down, nourish her, rest her, draw back out of her the creative expression she lost to modern culture and technology. And just, just it's like if a plant is struggling and it's almost dead, but there's a little bit of green there, I don't throw them out. I, I scratch my head a little bit and say, okay, let me get a fresh, bigger pot of really nutrient dense soil. Let me get it from the roots. Let me transplant it. Let me give it enough water. Let me make sure it's getting the right amount of sunshine. Maybe put a little fertilizer that's you know on top and that plant will come back to life. And the same is true 
for our children. If we just get curious about how did God make that body? What are the needs of the body? What are all of those cells expecting by way of proteins and fats and carbohydrates? You know, like, are there any compromises with nutrient uptake? Are there uh, gut issues? Um, are there brain blood barrier issues? All of those things are integral part of the solution to mental illness that is, is unfortunately missing in a significant way in the conventional experience. So, you know, because of the wonderful outcome with my own child, I rushed into the workplace with, with, with really unique answers. And um, it's just the privilege of my life to be able to do this work and to support families in probably one of the worst, darkest seasons of their lives. And to have God get the glory on the end of that is, I mean, some people even come to faith as we work. Some people come in as non-believers and leave this work as believers because it really is a miracle to watch some a child or even a mom who's so weepy and almost on the verge. And then you watch over time that life come back with vibrancy and a skill set. Go forward now knowing what your body needs. Live this way you will, you'll never have to dip as low as you dipped when we came to know each other. So um, I love that phenomenal. so much. It's so beautiful, Tracy, how you, how you give the analogies and you, you share the story. So when we're talking about these holistic measures, like, so we know sleep is incredibly important. We know time away from devices is incredibly important. We know exercise is important. There's so many things that we know, even tapping into our own creativity, having a gratitude practice. All of these things are so key for improving our mental health. And if we have children going through these struggles, they may not know these things, but that's our job as parents is to teach them, guide them. It's like bringing the horse to water. You know, you can't make them drink. However, what you can do is educate and you can share and you can do things alongside them to inspire them and support them and hold them up. And I think faith is a huge part of a mental health journey as well. But let's talk about that nutrition component, because I know that's something that you really dive deep into what the body needs to become healthier. And listen, listeners, I have to emphasize this. I mean, my, my pharmacy background I am not opposed to Western medicine, obviously. However, I think that we have so many holistic measures to employ that we can tap into that are natural and they're healthy because God created them to nurture us and give us everything we needed for our minds and bodies. So there's a time and place where sometimes we might need a little oomph to get us through so that then we can only use these other strategies. So we're not here to tell you, don't go to a doctor, don't get a prescription. But what we're here to encourage you is that there are means to help you navigate situations and give your body total wellness from the inside out, as well as the outside in, so that you're not always strapped to just one thing. And I think that's what Tracy was emphasizing when she was talking about her daughter is you can go to a doctor and they're going to say, oh, here's the solution. And they may give you a pill. Maybe they'll tell you to go see a therapist. But there's so much more because our bodies are so intricately created, so incredibly detailed, miraculously detailed, that sometimes the, these little tiny tiny details of minerals and vitamins and things like that can really make a huge difference in our overall health without having to go outside to things that were created in a lab. So there's a place, a time and a place for everything. But I think our conversation today is not to direct you one way or the other, but to give you the, the, the wealth of information to evaluate your situation, your child's situation in a way that you now have new insight and don't let someone dictate to you what you have to do. Bring in the resources to the conversation that could transform your child's life, maybe faster, easier, with less side effects, et cetera. Okay, so Tracy, I kind of rambled there a little bit, but I think it's important to say because we, you know, we're not telling them what to do. We just want to give them new insight, but what are those 
nutrients, minerals, supplements, the things that can be lacking that maybe we aren't aware of? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, before I unpack that, I just appreciate so much what you shared. And I want to reiterate it a little bit so that people do understand um, the message that I'm sharing. Um, you know, when we think about the time and place for, for interventions like medication, I always kind of pause and say, well, let's ask ourselves this question, especially if you're in the faith community and you're like, well, you know, God gave us everything that we need. We shouldn't, uh, you know, have to resort to like a pharmaceutical intervention. I really don't believe that at all. And I feel like any healing modality has to come from the hand of God because God is in the business of healing and resurrecting and making us whole. It's the enemy who tears down, who it's the enemy who destroys. So anything that is providing, whether short or long-term health and resolution to symptoms that interrupt the quality of your life, that is from God. So I'm not suggesting for even a fraction of a second that there isn't a time and a place for the, for the medication. For some people, it may be for the rest of their lives. And praise be to God that we have these brilliant minds that can come up with formulations that save people. That is phenomenal. Well, I guess my message is like, just again, to kind of piggyback off of what you shared is I like to come at this, notwithstanding really acute situations where people are either suicidal um, are physically harming themselves. Um, they're really in these profound, almost like life-threatening struggles. I, I feel like we really need that intervention, that medication intervention to at least calm the system down so the thoughts don't actually lead to action. Mm -hmm. So, but for, for the vast majority of people suffering with a mental health challenge, they kind of are more on that mild to moderate spectrum. Those are the people where I feel, and I think the extreme spectrum as well, but I feel like it should be concurrent effort. Um, but for the more mild, moderate people, especially those people of faith, it's just trusting that there is indeed a design. We know there's a designer, so that means that there is a design and getting curious and brave about the way we're living and finding all of the opportunities to up-level the way that we live. So we can't live the standard American lifestyle, eat the standard American diet, and expect this divine, flawless outcome with the physiology. That I mean, I, to say it like that, everybody must see logically, well, that's true. One plus one does not equal three. So, you know, there is just a, a, a logical way to kind of come at like the plant analogy. I, if I poured bleach into that dying plant, do you think that that would have brought it back to life? No. <laughs> so I would think like, hmm, what does a plant need? I just say, let's hold some holy space to say, what does a human being need? to thrive. And that's the work that I like to provide, whether in, you know, before you get the medication in, intervention or alongside, I, I often will work with people, psychiatrists and psychologists. And that's to me, the most ideal situation where you get this trifecta of experts coming in, staying in their respective lanes. Now you really have a team of, of holistic care around you because the therapy is a non-negotiable piece to this as well. So that being said, to answer your question, more directly as far as the nutrients. I mean, you know, it's a really tough question to answer on a, on a shorter podcast, but I will say this. If everybody could walk away from listening to this message, walk away with visualizing your typical plate in your, in, in your mind. Visualize the plate and be honest with yourself. What's typically on your dinner plate, if you will. Um, so most often, the standard American is going to have half like refined carbohydrates of some kind, French fries or mashed potatoes or um, lots of rice and things like that. Then maybe a small piece of commercial raised protein, which has its own unique problems and issues and probably not any, you know, maybe tiny bit of vegetables that maybe have been um, either overcooked, maybe are on the dirty dozen. And so that means they're fraught with all types of um, disrupting chemicals. So that's kind of the standard American plate. So whoever's listening, envision your plate. What did what does your daily plate look like? I'm going to tell you what it ought to look like. And then it, you can have this kind of word picture to shoot for. You know, when we're pulling back an arrow or our slingshot, 
right? David never would have been able to take Goliath out if he didn't have Goliath in front of him with a point on the body to aim for. If he just blindfolded himself and threw a rock in the slingshot, pulled it back and snapped it and crossed his fingers and toes and hoped it took the giant down, of course, that would never have been the outcome. He needed to see the giant, be near the giant, know that it was in the center of the head because all thoughts, all life comes from the thought life. So that's why the stone didn't land in the heart, didn't land in the liver, didn't land in the kidney. It landed right where the thought life lives. Goliath represents these these like seemingly insurmountable monsters in our life that are trying to destroy us. If we can get our thoughts in a better place where we know God's given us our slingshot, he's given us our one smooth stone, you're going to have to envision what you're aiming for and really with expertise, pull that stone back, launch it and let it take out whatever it is that's trying to rob you of wholeness of life. So that plate is that thing to envision, something to shoot for. So your plate should be cut it down the middle and that half should be um if you go to ewg environmental working group if you go to their website you will get a resource each year they put out a resource clean 15 and dirty dozen so they they survey the uh, crops throughout the country and come up with the dirtiest that have the most chemical residue and they come up with the cleanest that have the least chemical residue. Eat off the clean 15 and avoid the dirty dozen by going organic. Organic doesn't have none, but it has significantly less of all of those, um, all of that residue that will cause endocrine disaster and gut microbiome havoc in your body. So half that plate should be off the clean 15 or, or, or otherwise organic. Um, and make that a variety. The, the more color and the more texture, the more diverse the microbes you will be ingesting. That's another conversation for another day. So if you can just stick with me in the more simplistic council is a plate cut in half filled with those types of fruits and vegetables. Now cut the other half in, a, in, in half. So you have a quarter and a quarter. Clean, lean, healthy, raised protein where animals get to live a life closest to their indigenous type of life where a cow wants to graze. It doesn't want to be in a stockyard with its head through a metal uh, a metal gate and, and eating Skittles and M&Ms and GMO <laughs> grains. That's what they eat. They are bred on like factory default candy, um, you know, uh, discarded food items and really heavily processed grains. So if that's the animal's diet, how horrific must the quality of the meat be? Not to mention the impact of the stress hormones that circulate through the animal as it lives completely antithetical to the design. So that makes that those commercially raised animals really, really um, detrimental to health. So do the best you can to fill that quarter of that other part of the plate with um, really as, as clean uh, and lean protein as you can afford. And then their other part should have healthy fats, nuts, seeds, avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, ghee. Um, these are all really healthy sources of fat. The brain is 60% fat. So if the diet is replete and really high quality fats, uh, the brain is going to be the first organ to let you know that the body's in trouble. So it cannot do its daily nightly repair without the raw material coming in by way of that plate being designed in that in that way. So you can have some carbohydrates. So if you took that that last 25 percent, cut that in half, you can certainly have some um, potatoes. Potatoes are on the dirty dozen usually. So you want to look organic. Sweet potatoes have the lowest glycemic impact. So let's say sweet potatoes or rainbow color potatoes. If you're going to do rice, try to get yourself the best quality like jasmine organic rice, but just, just one eighth, just one eighth of your plate should be those starchy carbs. If you can even tolerate them, because some people really just can't tolerate them at all in terms of an insulin um, and glucose impact, but that, and then the other um, one eighth should be the fats. So that is what a healthy plate should look like. And I think for the vast majority of your listeners, they're probably like, eh, I got some work I have to do. So just starting there. And let me, let me add this too. Nutrition isn't just what's on your plate. It's how you eat it, when you eat it, and whom you eat it with. 
So, you know, all of that is as important as the composition of your plate. Are you eating seated without devices, engaging in, in, in really healthy conversation? Are you sharing about your day? Are you sharing about your struggles? You're, we always asked our kids, what was your highlight today? What was your low light today? Trying to create and foster connection and conversation. Are you eating slowly? Are you putting the fork down in between each bite? chewing your food thoroughly? Are you swallowing and not drinking too, too much water with your meal because you dilute your stomach acid and you compromise the uptake of nutrients that way? So there's like all these little other elements besides what you're actually eating, how you're eating it, why you're eating it, with whom you're eating it, when you're eating it. Um, that's all really important too. So um, that was a really power packed like explanation that if people play that a couple times and even take some notes, just making those changes in the who, what, when, where, why, how of what you're eating, um, you will see profound change in how you feel day by day. It's not going to happen in a day. It might. It depends how poorly you're eating. But if you stick with that and get underneath the design of God and give yourselves what they're expecting to receive by way of nutrition and experience and eating, you will absolutely feel a, a very big upswing um, in, in mood and mental performance. Oh, I love it so much. And it's so funny as you were talking, like I, I eat like how you suggested, like that's how our family eats. And it's, it's funny though, because if I'm given the opportunity, I would have a whole plate of rice. <laughs> I love organic Jasmine rice. <laughs> I don't know oh, why, yeah. but I love it. Um, it's so oh, funny, yeah. but I mean, my plate is usually greens, I put nuts in the salad and, you know, it's always, um, it, but it is, it is important because I think it's so easy as moms when we're in a hurry to take the easy way out. And I, but I think that what's important to notice is that you can, and I know we've heard, and I had people on the show too, that talked about meal prepping, but if you, if you want, you can actually cook really healthy very quickly. And it doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, I think I've mastered this solely. I mean, yeah. very humbly, I will say, um, because of sports, you know, it was always like, oh my gosh, they get home at this time. We have to be here at this time. And then we have to be here at this time. And, you know, just the, it was simply by necessity that I had to always be fast. Yep. Yep. But Absolutely. you can still have family meals. And I think something you said, and I want to emphasize, because I think we, we undervalue the importance of having those meals together and having the conversations. And that was one thing that I always did. I always made sure that we had a sit down dinner together, even if it was quick and on the go, we did it and we had a touch point. And I think when we're talking about mental health, it gives us an opportunity to see, is our child having more bad days than good days? Is our child experiencing something you can tell by their mood. You can tell right when they sit down at the table, how they're feeling, what, what they've experienced throughout the day. And I think that's a great touch point for moms. You can even tell by their appetite. Mm -hmm. If the appetite dips or if it's just out of control, insatiable, there's a mental health component that needs to be looked at there. If it's more of a consistent, you know, like I'm all about cleaning my plate, um, but, you know, making sure if you, again, if you go by that principle of the plate, um, you, you miss out on a lot of really important early signs of a child in distress if you're not sitting down and having one meal together. I know that for seven days a week, every single night dinner for most American families, that's a, that's a far stretch. But look at your unique life and really, just like we offer God our best in tithing, like we offer God our best in our prayer life, we offer God our best in our relationships. That's what we all should be striving for. God is the gap filler. So if your life genuinely, truly right now only allows for one or two nights, make those one or two nights meaningful, really make them powerful and then give it back to God and say, can you take these fishes and loaves and can you expand it so that we actually have baskets and baskets of leftovers to take home to consume later? That is the kind of God that we serve. So you really have, you just, you just have to be careful not to lie to yourself. Be really honest with yourself. Are you giving your best? And because God knows the secrets of every little heart. So, you know, he He already knows your, your inner reality, your inner truth. Just confess it to him. Be honest with your own self. And then when we give that best, 
to our God, our God is the gap filler. And um, I just, that's a huge missing piece from the standard American way of life is mealtime together that looks relatively holistic and, and whole food based and healthy. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, I think it's one of the biggest instruments of health that we have taken for granted as being insignificant. A calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And that's, that's a, that's a dangerous lie. Mm -hmm. A dangerous lie with severe yeah, I agree. So I want you guys. So first I want to emphasize everybody. I will link other notes, other shows in the show notes so that you can go and listen to get more information on healthy eating, um, exercising, and all of the, the good things that go into total body wellness. But I want to leave you with a scripture verse and it's first Corinthians six, 19 to 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And I think that's just the perfect verse to, to close out today's episode because um, God has given us these miraculous bodies and he's given them to us to care for. So whatever your journey is related to health, mental health and nutrition, um, that's your cue to start really evaluating how you can help yourself and help your child be healthier and have more mental health positivity versus negative mental health challenges. Tracy, will you tell the listeners how they can connect with you and learn more about you? I know you have some really great resources on your website that they can download as well. Sure, absolutely. Yes, everybody can find me at slingshothc.com. That's for health coaching. So slingshothc.com. As soon as you um, land on that page, there's two resources. You can help yourself to one or both. Um, to uh, There's some really great insights. If you're a mom who's struggling, there's a, a great downloadable um, for you there. If you're a mom whose child is struggling and you need some insight and support, there's a great downloadable for you there. I'm also on Instagram at Slingshot HC and I'm on Facebook at Slingshot Health Coaching. And I have a great active um, group called Heal Mom, Heal Her Family. Um, I think I think we're close to 600 members that have been there for maybe six, seven years now. It's a really loyal community, very engaged community. Love to have you join us there. Those free downloadables are pinned to the top of that group as well. So if you request um, admission, you'd be able to, to um, find those downloadable resources there too. Um, and there's also a book um, that I wrote um, very similar to you, Robin, um, that you can find on Amazon. And um, it's called From Chained to Changed, uh, Transforming Our Lives, Breaking Mental Strongholds. So like it, it talks about... Um, all the, you know, the power of the mind, everything that we do in our lives first began with a thought. So um, it talks about um, the parallels between elephants and humans. So elephants, um, there's a process called breaking the elephant. So they take the calf and they chain it, even though this animal grows to a couple tons. Um, if it's chained from small and it, and, it, and it experiences the futility of breaking that chain, even though it grows in size and stature and power, it believes it's still that small calf that can't break free from the bondage. And I think that we live our lives like that. I think oftentimes um, we are the elephant and what happens to us in our childhood, the limiting beliefs we pick up and adopt and integrate into our very selves as children, because um, we, again, the brain is a meaning maker machine. Um, we make false meanings in our childhood that we don't re-examine uh, as adults. Um, so it, it kind of walks us through the parallels there and how we can become uh, masters of our mindset. And then, then that's how by becoming masters of our mindset, we get to change the reality of our lives, our health stories and, and our mental health. So, um, yeah. I love it so much. And I will put your, the link to your website as well as the link to the book in the show notes. So you guys, please go over and check out those show notes because you will find a plethora of additional information and resources available to you. So cheers to your health journey and to being able to be a 
incredible mom that you probably already are, and now you just have additional resources to be an even better mom, which who doesn't love that, right? All right, thanks for being here, friends, and I will see you next time.